Hi there, I'm Ron Wright. I teach here at the law school at Wake Forest University, and we're talking about criminal procedure. In particular today, we're talking about uh, how to get enough proof to establish something that we call probable cause. This is the level of proof that you need to justify uh, going into a home or going into a car and searching somebody. And in particular, how do we deal with information that comes to the police from a confidential informant or from an anonymous source? So how do you deal with, uh, with anonymous sources or confidential sources as a part of probable cause? That's our topic for today. Let's go in and talk. Okay, folks, let's get started. We're talking today about Gates basics, the basics of probable cause that we learn in a case called uh, Illinois versus Gates, which is 462 U.S. 213, decided in 1983. The setting is this. We've, we know now that the police have to have probable cause to justify a full-blown search or seizure. If they're going to go into somebody's house and look around uh, or go into somebody's car and move things around, they're going to need probable cause. They're going to need to show enough evidence to demonstrate that it wasn't just a, a fishing expedition. It wasn't just a wild guess. That there was some serious set of reasons, some serious reasons ahead of time to believe that the search would produce something, that it would produce evidence of a crime that had been committed or is about to be committed. So you need some kind of probable cause and we've talked about the level of certainty involved there. It's probably not as high as a preponderance of the evidence, but it's certainly higher than reasonable suspicion, an, another standard that we've already uh, dealt with. So probable cause is the standard. Where are you going to get probable cause? Well, think about different possible sources. As a police officer, I might get probable cause because of what I've seen myself. I saw person A hit person B. That could be part of my evidence. We're not interested in that source here. You might get probable cause from crime witnesses who identify themselves, come talk to the officer, say, hey, I saw person A hit person B, or maybe I'm the victim and I saw person A hit me. You know, I felt it. I mean, I was there. So those are all possible sources. Um, but we're focused on another type, a more problematic type, and a more highly regulated type. This happens when you have either a confidential source, that is the police know who this person is, this person comes to them and says, I can tell you something about a crime that has happened or is about to happen, but you got to keep my name out of it. Don't tell anybody who I am. Keep my name confidential. So that would be a confidential informant or a confidential source. Or an anonymous source. A call comes in, a message comes in of some sort. You know, here's, some, here's a tip for you, where you that you can use to go out and solve a crime, but unsigned. I'm not going to tell you, you know, who I am, where this came from. You just, I just hope you'll go out and use the information to, to stop the crime or to solve the crime. So confidential sources or anonymous sources, they get special regulation here for a couple of reasons. For one thing, it's tough at the time of an application for a warrant you know, ahead of time, sometimes the, the police have to go and get special permission or articulated written permission from a judge or a judicial officer before carrying out certain searches, like the search of a home. That magistrate or judge at the time of the application has a hard time evaluating how credible this information is. It's just kind of comes out of the sky. I don't know anything about the background, the track record of this source of information. So tough at the time. It's also tough during the adversarial process for the defense lawyers to cross-examine anybody or to test the quality of the evidence uh, or for the uh, judge at trial to be able to evaluate the, uh, the quality of the source of the evidence. So because of this lack of ability to test the quality of the source, we're especially wary or you know, just especially alert when it comes to these uh, these searches that are uh, based on probable cause from a confidential source or from an anonymous source. So this brings us to Illinois versus Gates, our famous 1983 case. 
in this case, the police in Bloomingdale, uh, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, get an, they just receive out of nowhere an anonymous handwritten letter. It's on the 3rd of May, 1978, when they receive the letter. And the letter says this. The letter says, there's a couple in your town, Sue and Lance Gates, who make their living by selling drugs. They say all the time, isn't it great that we don't have to work very hard, we make our money from pushers. And they say that they're friends with some big drug dealers, and big drug dealers are always coming and going from their house. And the letter says, this is how they work. Uh, they, uh, they live in a condominium on Greenway off of Bloomington, Bloomingdale Road. They don't give an exact address, but they give that much of a description. And they say, when they're ready to bring in drugs, they get it from California. And so Sue will leave from their condo in Bloomingdale, or in, Blooming, yeah, in Bloomingdale, and will go to Florida, and will get the drugs there, uh, load up the car, then Lance will get on a flight, will fly down to Florida, and will drive the car, now full of drugs, back up to their home in Illinois. Sue will uh, get on a plane and fly back home, says the letter. Uh, and the letter says she's leaving on the 3rd, that is the day the letter arrives. She's leaving on the 3rd. And they'll be coming back soon after that, a few days after that, as, their, as is their normal uh, practice. And you're going to find $100,000 worth of, of uh, drugs in the trunk of that car. And there's also about $100,000 worth of drugs in their basement. Uh, hope you'll take care of this. You know, love and kisses your anonymous uh, informant. Well, the police assign this in matter for investigation to Detective Mater. And Detective Mater decides he'll check out some of the details, the ones that you can check out. So he looks around, and sure enough, there is an Illinois driver's license that has been issued to somebody named Lance Gates. It's at a Bloomingdale address, although not the one in the condo uh, off of, uh, or on Greenway off of Bloomingdale Road. Uh, but there is a driver's license issued to a Lance Gates of Bloomingdale. And they check around some financial records through a confidential informant. Uh, and can find through those financial records that there is a Lance Gates that lives uh, in the general area uh, on Greenway uh, off of uh, Bloomingdale Road. They also, uh, or the detective mater also calls to the airport, finds out from law enforcement agencies, uh, agents working there, that uh, a, an L. Gates has reserved a flight from Chicago to uh, Bloomingdale from uh, on the 5th of May, so two days later. Uh, and so they arrange for surveillance at the airport, and sure enough, on the 5th, Lance Gates, somebody who matches the photo in the driver's license, shows up, gets on the flight as reserved, flies to Florida. They follow him on the other end down in Florida to a hotel to a Holiday Inn where he checks into a room or walks into a room that has been checked out uh, that is now you know, being uh, used or rented by, uh, by Sue Gates or somebody who registered as Sue Gates. They wait the whole night. The next morning, Lance Gates comes out with a woman, presumably Sue Gates. They both get in the car and they start driving and they ultimately drive uh, all the way to Chicago. Notice Sue Gates does not, as the, lady, as the letter suggests, get on a plane and fly back. It's both of them uh, driving back. But they drive 22 hours, uh, very uh, limited uh, stops. Uh, and when they arrive home, by the time they get there, the uh, police officers in Illinois have obtained a uh, search warrant. They've gone to a judge. They've described the letter. Detective Mater has summarized everything that he's done in his investigation in an affidavit, put that package together, give it to the judge. The judge says, yes, that's enough for probable cause. You can go ahead and do the search. They find marijuana, 350 pounds of marijuana in the trunk of the car. They also find some drugs and firearms and other contraband in the house itself as they execute the warrant for the car and for the house. Uh, and so now there's a trial. And the gates say, 
you got to exclude this stuff because even though the judge granted the warrant, there wasn't really enough for probable cause there because it was based on such shaky information from a confidential or an anonymous, here an anonymous uh, source. The uh, appellate courts in Illinois agreed and, uh, well, ultimately the trial court uh, suppressed the, uh, the motion and the appellate courts in Illinois agreed and they said, you didn't do the sorts of things we normally require of, a, uh, of law enforcement for this specialized confidential anonymous source situation. Therefore, evidence thrown out. Uh, we're going to suppress the evidence. Appeal by the government up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Justice Rehnquist, notice not yet Chief Justice, but at that time Justice Rehnquist writes for the court and says, eh, we think this is the moment to change the test. We think we've, uh, ultimately we have allowed lower courts uh, reading our prior decisions to uh, go a little too far uh, in their development of a very strict test, a very detailed structured test, and we want to pull back from that and create a more uh, loosely defined and less well-structured uh, test. What was the old test? What's well, sometimes called the Aguilar-Spinelli Aguilar Aguilar test uh, after two famous cases. Uh, Spinelli versus the United States, the key case uh, here. Uh, and in Spinelli, uh, the court says you got to have two things if you're going to have a valid uh, showing of probable cause for this specialized situation, the anonymous or confidential informants. First of all, you got to show what is the basis of knowledge. Why does this informant believe that these things are true? Is it just that the informant is guessing? Or is the informant well situated to observe details and to be on, in on inside information? You know, exactly what is the basis for the, for the uh, informant's claims? Why is it that the informant believes these things are true? And then the second prong of this test, the second set of questions you ask is, how about the veracity and reliability of the informant? Put another way, why is it that the police believe the claims of the informant? What is it about this informant's track record, perhaps? This person comes to us all the time and has given us good information in the past. Or what is it about our investigation that confirms the details that one can confirm? You know, they told us about a bunch of things that happened in the past and then predict some th things that will happen in the future. And we went out and checked out, and as much as we could, it looks like the things that already happened did happen. Like Lance Gates does indeed live at that address that the letter said he lived at. So you're basically asking, why do the police believe this informant under the veracity and reliability uh, prong? Justice Rehnquist here says, let's get away from all of that. No two-step process or two-prong approach. You don't have to you know, sort of get up to snuff for both of these uh, showings. It's just all a general reasonableness question, a totality of the circumstances. Everything comes in. The judge, in a very common sense way, looks at all of it. Perhaps you're a little bit short in one category, but you're a little above uh, standard in the other category. And when you put it all together, there's enough there to inspire confidence that you know, amounts to a probable cause. So the court's opinion is full of, of references to the common nature, non-technical uh, quality of the probable cause standard, in part because the court said that's the way historically the, uh, the framers of the Constitution were thinking about it, partly because the, of the realities of criminal enforcement. You're dealing with high volume situations and with uh, people who are relying on practical wisdom, their own understanding of conditions on the street or in their particular uh, locality. Uh, awfully hard to reduce this to a set of you know, national two-pronged standards. Uh, you need to be able to uh, account for a variety of practice from, uh, from place to place. So that's the court's opinion, abandoning, or if not abandoning, pulling back from modulating the old two-prong rule of Aguilar Spinelli, uh, and instead saying this is a totality of the circumstances reasonableness test. Now it turns out that state courts have the power to stick with the old Aguilar Spinelli test, something somewhat more demanding in terms of you know, what the officers have to show. It's an add-on on top of the federal minimum requirements. Uh, and some states have done that. They have the power to do that and some have in fact 
stuck with Aguilar Spinelli. What's at stake in this choice between the two different types of standards? Well, on one basic level, maybe, you know, the, the Gates standard tends to produce more pro-prosecution results than the earlier two-prong standard. It's, uh, you probably can save a few cases under the uh, general uh, reasonableness test that you would have lost under the two-prong test, but not necessarily. I'll get to this in a minute. Uh, but as a general first cut matter, uh, more room to operate for uh, law enforcement agencies, for better and for worse. That's part of the choice of Gates versus the earlier Aguilar-Spinelli uh, test. It's also a choice about which institutions matter. So under the earlier test, the two-prong test, appellate courts are relatively more important. They are the ones that, uh, that can really define probable cause and can develop a series of more detailed rules. Under the Gates test, it decentralizes that question, pushes it out of the appellate courts, out of the state capitol, out into the field, into the hands of magistrates and trial judges who will be the primary local interpreters of the, of the looser general standard of, uh, of Gates. Uh, and this is also a choice about the power of law to provide for uniform guidance. So Aguilar Spinelli provides more uniformity, more consistency across an entire jurisdiction. Gates expresses more skepticism, really, about the power of legal rules to appropriately describe a situation that you're going to encounter in the future and to get it right without you know, being over-inclusive or under-inclusive. So Gates is less ambitious when it comes to the power of law to uh, constrain appropriately and to create uh, proper, you know, effective uniformity. One final point about the choice between these uh, two standards. If you know the standard that you've got involved in a particular case, the, the standard that the state courts have adopted there, whether it be the older standard, Aguilar Spinelli, or the later 1983 Illinois versus Gates uh, standard, you can go to the case law and you can read which one has our state Supreme Court adopted for purposes of our state constitution. But if you know the legal standard, you don't know nearly enough. You also have to know something about the local legal culture. Because under the Gates standard, a very general, amorphous statement, you might still have very demanding judges who require an awful lot of law enforcement under this very opaque standard. And so you can find examples of courts saying, we're applying the Gates standard, but the government loses because we are saying, without giving you a lot of detail, there's just not enough here under the general reasonableness standard. So one last lesson to learn from this legal doctrine is that legal doctrine ain't everything. You have to know the doctrine, you have to know the test that they apply, but you also have to know the legal culture a general lesson about uh, the power of law, but certainly true across a lot of areas of criminal procedure. So that's it for this topic. We'll talk again next time. <laughs>